This is Space Time, Series 20, Episode 29. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You can download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast just about everywhere, including iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, direct from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. Space Time is also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world through TuneIn Radio, and as in-flight entertainment aboard Virgin Australia. Coming up on Space Time, discovery of new warning signs for supernovae, more tantalising hints of possible past life on Mars, and a giant cold spot discovered on Jupiter. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have detected a potential new warning sign displayed shortly before a star is destroyed in a supernova explosion. A report in the journal Nature Physics claims the progenitor stars of core collapse or type 2 supernovae display significant instability in the final year leading up to their cataclysmic destruction. A core collapse supernova occurs when the most massive stars reach the end of their lives and suddenly explode in an event bright enough to outshine an entire galaxy. Stars shine on what astronomers refer to as the main sequence through the core nuclear fusion of hydrogen into helium. Once the hydrogen in a star's core runs out, the fusion process stops and the star moves off the main sequence to become a red giant. Stars are a sort of cosmic balancing act between the outwards force generated by nuclear fusion in the core and the inwards force of gravity generated by the star's mass. The effect is called hydrostatic equilibrium. However, once nuclear fusion stops, gravity takes over, forcing the star to begin to contract in on itself. This causes dramatic increases in temperature and pressure at the stellar core, eventually becoming strong enough to trigger helium in the core to begin fusing into carbon and oxygen. Meanwhile, hydrogen in the shell outside the stellar core now begins fusing into helium. Eventually, the core helium supply runs out and the star undergoes further gravitational contraction, increasing core temperatures and pressures even further until carbon fusion begins. This process of core and shell nuclear fusion of progressively heavier and heavier elements continues, with carbon fusing into neon, sodium, magnesium and aluminum, and then neon fusing into oxygen and magnesium. Oxygen then fuses into silicon, sulfur, argon and calcium. And finally, silicon fuses into nickel, which then radioactively decays into cobalt and iron. However, because iron and nickel have the highest binding energy per nucleon of all the elements on the periodic table, energy can no longer be produced through nuclear core fusion. And so the nickel-iron core simply grows and grows more massive. At the same time, the core is placed under huge gravitational pressure to further contract. However, as there's no further nuclear fusion to counteract this gravitational contraction, gravity wins. The stellar core is now only supported against further collapse by electron degeneracy pressure. That's a state of matter in which further collapse would cause two or more electrons to occupy the same energy state at the same time, which isn't possible under the Pauli exclusion principle, which we discussed on Space Time the other week. However, if the stellar core's mass exceeds 1.4 times the mass of our Sun, a figure known as the chandra sekhar limit, electron degeneracy pressure can no longer hold out against further core collapse. The final phase of the star's existence sees the catastrophic collapse of the stellar core. The outer part of the core, reaching velocities of up to 70,000 km per second, some 23% the speed of light, as it collapses down towards the centre of the star. At the same time, the rapidly shrinking core heats up, producing high-energy gamma rays. These gamma rays decompose the iron nuclei into helium nuclei and free neutrons through a process called photodisintegration. As the core's density increases, its electrons and photons are literally crushed together, forming neutrons. In the process, releasing elemental particles called electron neutrinos. Because neutrinos are so weakly interactive with all other matter, there are literally billions of them passing through you right now. These neutrinos can escape from the core, carrying away energy and further accelerating the collapse. And all this is proceeding over timescales of just milliseconds. 
As the core detaches from the outer layers of the star, some of these neutrinos are absorbed by the star's outer layer envelope, beginning the supernova explosion. Eventually, the core reaches the density of an atomic nucleus, and the core collapse process is halted by strong nuclear force interactions between neutrons and by neutron degeneracy pressure, which, as with electron degeneracy pressure, prevents two neutrons occupying the same space at the same time. The newly formed neutron core has an initial temperature of about 100 billion Kelvin. That's an incredible 10 to the 4 times the temperature of the Sun's core. Once the stellar core collapse stops, the infalling matter rebounds, producing a massive shockwave propagating outwards. This releases even more neutrinos, this time as neutrino-antineutrino pairs, which provide the energy to dramatically increase the power of the supernova explosion. Eventually, what's left behind will be a rapidly spinning neutron star. The new research by scientists at Israel's Weizmann Institute shows that the stars that become so-called core collapse supernovae may be exhibiting instability for several months before the big event, spewing material into space and creating a dense gas shell around themselves. One of the study's authors, Dr. Ofe Yaron, says many massive stars, including the red supergiants that are the most common progenitors of these core collapse supernovae, may begin the process in just this way. The discovery is based on work by the Polymer Transient Factory, a fully automated sky survey using the telescopes of the Mount Palomar Observatory in Southern California. Astrophysicists and astronomers in Israel are on call for the telescope, which scans the California night skies for the sudden appearance of new astronomical transients, indicating the appearance of a new supernova. After detecting just such an event in October 2013, Yaron contacted Dan Perley, who was observing that night on the giant twin 10-metre Keck telescopes in Hawaii and also NASA Swift Space Telescope. At Keck, the researchers soon began to record spectra from the event. Because they were able to start their observing within three hours of the blast, the authors have been able to assemble the most detailed ever spectral database of the core collapse process, including X-rays, ultraviolet data, as well as four separate spectroscopic measurements from between six and ten hours after the blast. This new study has analysed the unique data set collected over the first few days of the supernova event. The time window was crucial because it enabled the team to detect material that had been surrounding the star pre-explosion as it heated up and became ionised and was eventually overtaken by the expanding cloud of stellar debris. Comparing the observed early spectra and light curve data with existing models accompanied by later radio observations led the researchers to conclude that the explosion was preceded by a period of instability probably lasting around a year. This instability caused material to be expelled from the surface layers of the star, forming the circumstellar shell of gas observed in the data. Because this was found to be a relatively standard Type II or core collapse supernova, the researchers believe that the instability they revealed may in fact be a regular warm-up act to the imminent explosion. Astronomers are still trying to understand many of the details of the processes which make stars explode as supernovae. Yaron says the new findings are raising fresh questions, such as exactly what is the final trigger which finally trips a star from merely unstable to explosive. The Palomar Transient Factory collaboration allows scientists to alert a range of different telescopes around the world to train their sights on a supernova event. That's allowing researchers to get closer and closer to understanding exactly what's happening in that instant, how massive stars end their lives, and what leads up to that final explosion. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. Scientists re-examining minerals, originally studied years ago by NASA's Mars rover Spirit, now believe they could represent a tantalising possible biological marker of past life on the red planet. The minerals, known as opaline silica deposits, were examined by the six-wheeled golf cart-sized robotic rover back in 2007. They were discovered near a circular geological feature called Home Plate in the inner basin of the Columbia Hills region in the red planet's Gusev crater. Opaline silica is a rubbery-looking substance that forms around hot springs, geysers and in steaming fumarole vents around volcanoes, releasing steaming hot sulfur-rich gases into the atmosphere. The Martian opaline silica discovery was taken as evidence of past hydrothermal or volcanic activity at the site. However, a report in the journal Nature Communications claims the opaline silica deposits found on Mars had unusual clumpy nodules and tiny finger-like structures, similar to features found on opaline silica deposits on Earth, which are formed next to sticky mats of microorganisms called biofilms. 
The study's lead author, Steve Ruff from Arizona State University, originally thought the Martian opaline silica deposits formed billions of years ago from basaltic rocks leached by sulfuric acid pouring out of fumaroles. However, as he continued to analyse the Spirit Rover data, he began to suspect that the Martian mineral may instead have precipitated out of hot mineral-rich waters. Ruff and colleagues then travelled to the El Tatio geyser field in the high Andes of northern Chile, some 4,320 metres above sea level, where similar deposits of opaline silica have been discovered. The opaline silica found at El Tatio form in shallow hydrothermal waters and closely resemble their Martian counterparts. Now, importantly, the authors knew that in some environments, microbes actively trigger the mineral's formation. It's worth noting, however, they found no evidence of that occurring at El Tatio. Still, Ruff points out that other studies have shown how microbial mats forming in shallow water will begin connecting to whatever's there, and that includes the silica nodules. And as they cling onto the nodules, they eventually become encased within the silica. Ruff wants to know if the opaline silica on Mars, which has the same shape, formed in the same way. Launched just weeks apart in 2003 on two separate Delta II rockets from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base in Florida, NASA's twin Mars exploration rovers Spirit and Opportunity were originally designed to last about 90 days on the red planet's surface. Amazingly, they just kept going for year after year. However, any chance of sending Spirit back to home planet for another look was dashed in 2009 when the rover became bogged in sand with its solar panels pointing away from the sun. Spirit continued to operate as a stationary science platform until finally running out of power in 2010. Amazingly, Opportunity is still operational. It recently set a new record for the furthest distance travelled by any vehicle on the surface of another world. Opportunity, or Oppie as they call it, is still working and it's continuing to travel across the Meridiani Planum undertaking scientific observations. To find out more about these silicate deposits... Andrew Dunkley is speaking with Dr. Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory. It's a big call, but there is some evidence that has now been discovered that could suggest a biosignature of some kind. And that is some formations on Mars that look like they could have only been formed with the assistance of microbial life, which is only comparable with something that they've seen on Earth. Have I got that basically correct? Absolutely. In fact, you've You've done the story there and then. Okay, <laughs> thank you for joining us. On... <laughs> yeah, good to talk to you. <laughs> no, that, that's absolutely right. So this goes back to um, the Spirit rover, which is now defunct, of course. Spirit touched down on Mars's surface, I think it's 12 years ago when it got going. It um, did a fine job of exploring a place called Gusev Crater, which is in Mars's equatorial regions, and then got bogged in uh, one of the sand dunes. And because it was tipped over, so its solar panels were facing a away from the sun, its batteries ran out it and it became sleep. That happened a few years ago. It's, it's um, companion spacecraft, though, which was called Opportunity. That's still going. It's nowhere near where Spirit was, but it's still producing fantastic data. Yeah, from and the surface just of there's a sideline. How far past its use-by date is it now? Well, <laughs> the use-by date was 90 days, and yeah. this is 12 years later. That's so amazing. They build these things to last. Yeah, it's fabulous stuff. So what's happened is that some of the, the geological information that came from Gusev Crater has been reanalyzed, and it's looking closely at those data that has led scientists to actually to speculate that what we're seeing is the effect of minerals that were formed in the presence of biological organisms. Now, it's not proof. This is not proof, but it is very strongly suggestive of living organisms on Mars probably 3.8 or 4 billion years ago, a long, long time in the past. Mm. So the details of this are that the particular outcrops that they're looking at are things called opaline silicates, and they form basically in many different ways of forming. But the way that they believe these silicates formed on Mars is around a hot spring or a geyser or the fumaroles, the, the things where, um, you know, gases come out of the earth, these vents which are associated with volcanic activity. Right, so uh, like a black smoker in the ocean, for example? Yes, that's right. Yeah. The same sort of thing, but on land. Yeah. And so the rocks that Spirit investigated were actually basaltic rocks, but they, they were sort of leached to form these silica deposits. That mm -hmm. is one suggestion as to how these rocks take on the strange shape that they've got. But there is now a more favoured interpretation of that. And it comes because of investigations that have taken place here on Earth in a huge hydrothermal 
system in northern Chile. It's actually 4,300 metres above sea level. You can barely breathe when you're there, and I know because I was there last year. Yes. It's a place called El Tatio, and it is very spectacular. It's a place where there is a lot of geyser activity and all these fumaroles emitting stuff from the Earth's depths. What has happened is scientists have looked at opaline silica deposits in Chile, and they see a great similarity to the ones that have been found on the surface of Mars. But the key thing is that these silica material, uh, minerals on the Earth have actually been modified by the presence of microbial life. There are what are called biomats, which are kind of like sticky mats, mats of, of bacteria. Sometimes they're called biofilms, which is a, probably a better description. Biofilms are these mats of material. Mm. And those biofilms actually affect the formation of the minerals. And so all the investigations that these guys have carried out seems to suggest that the ones on Mars have the same origin as the ones on Earth. And that suggests that perhaps they formed in the presence of biofilms. We don't know. It's not just that they look the same. There's been a spectral analysis done that suggests the same sort of thing. And by that, I mean that the light from these silica deposits has been analysed to form the rainbow spectrum and look at the signatures of different elements in there. And it seems that there is actually really interesting evidence that maybe these two different places in the solar system form their opaline silica deposits in the same way. Wow. Uh, that, how, how do we prove it, though? That's a really good question. I think what you would like to do is send spirit back to do more measurements. But of course, spirit is no longer with us in the sense that it's no longer an operating spacecraft. And so one possibility is maybe to target Gusev Crater and in particular these deposits with the next space probe that goes to Mars. There are a number of them that are planned. Whether that will happen or not, I don't know. The targeting of these landers and these rovers is always a fairly intense business in terms of deciding where they're going to go because you want to get one shot at it. Yes. And so, um, you want to you know, get it right. And you want to get it right. That's we've right. had so many correct. wrongs over the years. You, Indeed. You know, it's a yeah. risky business, but wouldn't it be exciting? I mean, it also adds weight to the possibility, Fred, that we share life with Mars, perhaps. I mean, we know that planets and other heavenly bodies swap rocks and things like that. So is it feasible to consider that these microbial life forms might have been some kind of swap between the planets? We are here because it was there, for example. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a possibility. The idea that we can swap living organisms between the planets is one that's well established and we know that our microorganisms can at some level survive in space. I suppose if ever we do find microorganisms on Mars, a DNA test will be the one that actually gives you some sort of evidence as to whether we have a common origin. Yes, won't it be exciting? And look, we're one step closer by the sound of it. And like you said, there's no absolute evidence or proof at the moment, but the numbers are starting to stack up, aren't they? Indeed they are. Yeah, mm. it's all part of the build-up of evidence. That's Dr Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and junk on the web I find interesting, important, or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter. And on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com forward slash spacetime with Stuart Gary. Scientists have discovered evidence of surprisingly strong space weather activity on the distant planet Uranus. Researchers combined two images of the ice giant taken by NASA's Earth Orbiting Space Telescope with earlier observations by NASA's Voyager 2 spacecraft taken in 1986. The combined image shows the planet's ring system and its auroral activity. The data has allowed scientists to study the effects of geomagnetic storms on the Sun and some of the most distant worlds in the solar system. Ever since Voyager 2 beamed back its first spectacular images of the outer planets during its grand tour of the solar system in the 1980s, astronomers have been fascinated by the auroral activity detected on other worlds. Auroras are caused by streams of charged particles like electrons. They come from various sources, such as the solar wind from the sun, 
from planetary ionospheres and from volcanism. They become caught up in powerful planetary magnetic fields and are channeled into the upper atmosphere, where their interactions with gas particles such as oxygen or nitrogen can set off spectacular bursts of light. Earth's aurora australis in the southern hemisphere and aurora borealis in the northern hemisphere are well studied and always appreciated by spectators and scientists alike. Auroras on Saturn and Jupiter are also well studied, but not much is known about the auroras on the giant ice planet Uranus. In 2011, the Hubble Space Telescope became the first Earth-based observatory to image auroras on Uranus. Then in 2012 and 2014, a team of astronomers from the Paris Observatory took a second look at the auroras of Uranus using the ultraviolet capabilities of the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph installed on Hubble. They tracked the interplanetary shocks caused by two powerful bursts of solar wind travelling from the Sun to Uranus. The researchers then used Hubble to capture their effect on the auroral activity of Uranus. And they observed the most intense auroras ever seen on the ice giant. By watching the auroras over time, the team collected the first direct evidence that these powerful shimmering regions actually rotate with the planet. They also rediscovered Uranus's long-lost magnetic poles, which were lost shortly after their discovery by Voyager 2 in 1986 due to uncertainties in measurements in the featureless surface of this distant planet. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered a great cold spot on Jupiter. The newly found feature is comparable in size to Jupiter's famous Great Red Spot, which dominates the Jovian Southern Hemisphere. A report in the journal Geophysical Research Letters claims the phenomenon may have existed for thousands of years. The feature provides the first direct evidence of a sustained weather system generated by polar aurora, and it opens the possibility of finding similar features on other planets. The so-called Great Cold Spot was observed as a localised dark patch on Jupiter some 24,000 kilometres long and around 12,000 kilometres wide. It was detected in the gas giant's thin high-altitude thermosphere, where temperatures are some 200 Kelvin cooler than the surrounding atmosphere, which can range in temperature from between 700 and 1,000 Kelvin, that's 426 to 726 degrees Celsius. The study's lead author, Associate Professor Tom Stallard, says it's the first time any weather feature on Jupiter's upper atmosphere has been observed away from the planet's bright aurora. It seems the Great Cold Spot is much more volatile than the slowly changing, better-known Great Red Spot. In fact, the cold spot can change dramatically in both size and shape over periods of just days and weeks. And observations show it's been forming and reforming for at least the past 15 years. Stallard says that suggests that it continually reforms itself, and as a result, it may be as old as the aurora that form it, perhaps many thousands of years. The Great Cold Spot's thought to be caused by the effects of the planet's magnetic field, with its massive polar aurora driving energy into the atmosphere in the form of heat flowing around the planet. This creates a region of cooling the thermosphere, the boundary layer between the underlying atmosphere and the vacuum of space. Although scientists aren't sure exactly what's driving this weather feature, they suspect some kind of sustained cooling is powering a vortex, similar to the Great Red Spot. Astronomers use the VLT, the Very Large Telescope in Chile, to observe spectral emissions of specific hydrogen ions in the Jovian atmosphere, mapping both temperature and density. They then compared images of the spectral emissions from Jupiter's ionosphere taken by NASA's Infrared Telescope Facility between 1995 and the year 2000. Finally, they combined over 13,000 images taken over more than 40 nights by the Infrared Telescope Facility to reveal the presence of the Great Cold Spot in an area of darkness surrounded by the hot environment of Jupiter's upper atmosphere. Unlike Earth, where weather systems are fairly ephemeral, weather patterns on Jupiter can last for extended periods. The Great Cold Spot's been around for at least the 15 years' worth of data scientists have for it so far. And of course, the famous Great Red Spot, the massive anticyclone in Jupiter's lower atmosphere, has been around at least since it was first discovered by Galileo Galilei over 400 years ago. The two main differences are that firstly, Earth's aurora sees dramatic changes caused by activity from the Sun, whereas Jupiter's auroral activity is dominated by gases from its volcanic moon Io, which are relatively slow, steady and continuous. Secondly, the atmospheric flows generated by Earth's auroral activity can quickly drive heat across the entire planet, making the upper atmosphere ring like a bell, while Jupiter's fast spin, a day takes just 10 hours, tends to trap energy nearer the poles. Stellar describes the detection of the Great Cold Spot as a real surprise. 
and he thinks there are indications that other features may also exist in Jupiter's upper atmosphere. And so the team are now looking for other features in the upper Jovian atmosphere, as well as investigating the Great Cold Spot itself in more detail. NASA's Juno spacecraft is currently orbiting Jupiter, studying the gas giant's aurora and upper atmosphere. When combined with ongoing observations using ground-based telescopes on Earth, Stellard hopes to gain a much better understanding of the Great Cold Spot's weather system over the next few years. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And finally for now, three members of the Expedition 50 crew aboard the International Space Station have returned safely to Earth after more than 173 days in orbit. The Soyuz descending under its uh, parachute for venting of hydrogen peroxide, which is a normal occurrence as uh, the Soyuz comes out of the region of uh, the Earth's atmosphere heading toward its landing site. So again, uh, the normal venting of hydrogen peroxide from the propulsion system uh, on the Soyuz MSO2 spacecraft. Everything uh, has gone by the book uh, with the Soyuz. A short time from now, we uh, are expecting uh, the Soyuz to regain uh, communications through the Antonov 26 fixed-wing aircraft that is flying in the vicinity of the landing site as the main cog of the uh, command and control for the search and recovery forces. Eight Russian Mi-8 helicopters are now in the vicinity, flying in a racetrack pattern around the landing site, awaiting the arrival of Rizhikov, Kimbro, and Borisenko. That heat shield being jettisoned to expose the base of the uh, Soyuz descent module, its altimeters, and its soft landing engines. The Soyuz MSO-2, under its main parachute, flight controllers have relayed uh, up to Oleg Novitsky aboard the International Space Station that everything is going perfectly and that the crew is in excellent condition. On a cloudless day on the steppe of Kazakhstan, the the uh, Soyuz MSO-2 under its main parachute after uh, it uh, barreled through the Earth's atmosphere. G-forces uh, on the crew building to about 4.3 times that of Earth's gravity, we are told. Everything has gone uh, by the book, however, with all of the activities uh, and communications, in fact, uh, between uh, the Mission Control Center here in Karlyov and the crew on board the Soyuz has uh, been not bad, considering uh, that from time to time they can be uh, disrupted and choppy uh, by the, the speed of the sent by the Soyuz through the Earth's atmosphere. However, communications have been fairly solid all the way down, and Sergei Rizhikov, uh, the Soyuz commander, has provided updates to the flight control team here in Korolev. On a cloudless Monday afternoon on the steppe of Kazakhstan, we are minutes away from touchdown to complete a 173-day, 73.2 million-mile mission for Shane Kimbrough. Andrei Borisenko and Sergei Rizhikov, the Soyuz descending under its main parachute. We're expecting almost a precise bullseye touchdown for the Soyuz MSO-2. <laughs> minutes until touchdown, everything uh, proceeding on track as uh, we are an anticipating an on-time touchdown for the Soyuz MSO-2 and its three crew members, completing uh, the six-month journey of Expedition 50 on board the International Space Station. Good telemetry being received uh, by the search and recovery forces at the landing site, about 89 miles to the southeast of the town of Jezkazgan on the south central steppe of Kazakhstan. We copy. Thanks. A pair of uh, Russian Mi-8 helicopters flying in front of the uh, long-range camera uh, that is tracking uh, the final moments of the flight of the Soyuz MSO-2, which was launched uh, atop a Soyuz booster from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan last October 19. The crew uh, now bracing uh, for touchdown that is coming up, and touchdown is now confirmed. Touchdown confirmed at 6.20 and 35 seconds a.m. Central Time, 7.20 and 35 seconds a.m. Eastern Time. Their Soyuz MS-02 capsule landed with a bumpy touchdown and roll on the cold Kazakhstan steppe some 52 minutes after undertaking their deorbit burn 400 kilometres above the Earth's surface. While aboard the space station, the crew had worked on hundreds of experiments in biology, biotechnology, physics and earth sciences, including microgravity stem cell research designed to treat disease and injuries in space and provide new stem cell production techniques for use on Earth. The safe return of the Expedition 50 crew leaves three members aboard the orbiting outpost. It also marks what will hopefully be a temporary reduction in space station crew complement from six to five. That's being done because of cost cuts by the Russian Federal Space Agency Roscosmos. The upcoming Soyuz MS-04 Expedition 51-52 mission, slated for launch on April the 20th from the Baikonur Cosmodrome, 
will only carry two rather than three crew members to the space station. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, your favourite podcast download provider, or direct from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. The show's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio and as part of Virgin Australia's in-flight entertainment. If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and junk on the web I find interesting, important, or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com forward slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts or Audio Boom. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.